October 3rd, 2012, in the village of Swanley, Kent, England. A picturesque village nestled 16 miles away from central London and the home to St Paul's Church. If you were ever to visit, the rural views surrounding Swanley Village will make you forget, just for a moment, that the bustling capital city is just a stone's throw away. Though, on that particular October day, the tranquility of Swanley Village would be forever destroyed. And in a tale of herd mentality, betrayal, lies and love, let's discuss the case of Natalie Jarvis. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. Unit 2, move into position. Units 3 and 4, maintain coverage of Sector 7. I'm not guilty. Hopefully the clear and we have a visual. Indeed, we have a visual. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this episode, I'd just like to give a massive thank you yet again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. My regular viewers will know Magellan TV has been a constant supporter of this channel and other true crime channels, and we really wouldn't be able to make the content that we do without their help. So please don't hesitate to go show them some love and check out their extensive library of really interesting documentaries, all ranging from true crime, history, science, space, and even nature documentaries. Magellan TV was created by filmmakers and their producers alongside talented curators to ensure that each and every documentary on their service is the most premium you can find. I just finished watching Night Terror, The Search for Truth, which is a shorter documentary about 25 minutes, and it explores a double murder from April 2006 in Cape Town. The investigation into the murders is interesting to say the least. So after you've watched it, I'd love if you could drop a comment on this video or send me a tweet or Instagram DM with your opinions and thoughts on that case. Use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments to back yourself a one month free trial to Magellan TV, including all of their 4K documentaries at no extra cost. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. Yeah. Um, service, where is the help required? Um, I'm in Swanley Village, and there's a, a girl or a woman lying uh, at the side of the road, uh, appears to be unconscious. Okay, is she breathing? Is she breathing? Uh, we can't feel her breathing, can't feel the pulse. But she's warm. How old is she? Um, I don't, uh, we don't know, she's face down and we don't really want to move her in case right. she's tired. Um, right, listen, no, I'm telling you to move her now. Roll right, her back for me. Move her, roll her onto her back, roll her onto her back. The dispatcher instructed the passerbys to begin administrating CPR and dispatched paramedics immediately to Swanley Village Road. Keep One, going, alright, keep going and do not stop until I tell you. Right, keep doing this until help arrives. So you said that she's bleeding from the head? Yeah. Okay. You say she's bleeding from her neck? Yeah, blood everywhere. Alright, we're not too far away, we're actually just coming into Swanley now, alright? Okay, thank you. Just keep going until the ambulance person takes over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Sadly, by the time the paramedics had arrived on scene, it was too late. Despite the best efforts by the passerbys and the paramedics, the woman that lay before them passed away. It was immediately clear that whoever this was had been brutally murdered. The woman had been found wearing her dressing gown, pyjamas and slippers. She had no identification on her, no bank cards and no mobile phone. And it didn't take long for the police to arrive on scene who proceeded to cordon off the streets so their investigations could begin. Their first, most pressing question to answer was, who was the murdered young Jane Doe before them? Unfortunately, in a strange twist, it wouldn't be long before the Jane Doe's killer would walk through the doors of the local police station. At around 2 a.m. in the early hours of the 4th of October 2012, a 22-year-old man walked into the police station 
and told the authorities that he believed he had just murdered someone, Natalie Jarvis. Natalie Jarvis was born on Friday the 28th of April 1989 in Swanley, Kent, England. She had one older sibling, Gemma Jarvis, who was four years older than her, and together with their parents Adele and Mark, they formed a happy and loving family of four. Despite the four-year age gap between Natalie and her older sister Gemma, they were still as close as could be. They told each other everything, and Natalie had actually been the first person in the family that Gemma had come out to. Together, the sisters came up with a way to tell their parents about Gemma's sexuality. Natalie refused to let Gemma go through this extremely daunting and scary experience alone, and supported her through it all. Thankfully, the Jarvis family were one of acceptance and love, and Gemma's coming out just further showed how much the family unit supported one another. I've actually spoken with Natalie's mother, Adele Jarvis, about Natalie, who she was, her dreams, what her personality was like, and Adele was very happy to share the joy that her daughter Natalie not just brought into her life, but into the lives of everybody Natalie knew. Natalie was a wonderful, beautiful, and caring daughter, who had the biggest heart and a smile that could instantly put you into a good mood. And naturally, Natalie's character attracted many friends into her life. She was popular and always had her friends over at her house just to stay over or to hang out with. Natalie was a loud and cheerful person. Her sister Gemma described her as being the life of the party and the kind of person you can usually hear before you see them. I'm sure we all know somebody just like that. And when you do see them, they always bring a smile to your face. Natalie embraced her life. She did well at school, and after leaving school, she went on to get a job at the local McDonald's. As she ventured into her early 20s, Natalie became focused on just enjoying life and experiencing life to its fullest. When I spoke with Adele, she told me that she loved being Natalie and Gemma's mother. She explained to me that she felt as if it was something she was born to do. The family home was almost always a fun and happy environment, and Gemma and Natalie would just go out and do a lot of things together. They would go shopping together, they would just hang out together all the time. They truly were the best of friends. Natalie's popularity saw her frequently go out with her friends. She would go to the pubs, the clubs, and just generally hang out with all of the people that she knew all the time. And as can be expected, at the age of 23, in 2012, Natalie and her friends used their mobile phones and computers to talk and message constantly. On one occasion, Natalie's father walks into the office in the family home to find Natalie using the landline phone, using the mobile phone, and using her computer all at the same time. And just like many of her friends, Natalie absolutely loved music, in particularly Westlife. Natalie would crank up the volume as loud as it would go and dance around the room, singing along to her favourite songs. It also wasn't uncommon for Natalie when quickly just nipping out of the house to go to the shops or just going to hang out with her friends at their houses to go out still wearing her pyjamas and dressing gown. Four years before tragedy would strike the Jarvis family in 2008, as she often did, Natalie went with her friends to the local pub and it was at the local pub that she first met a man called Adam Wheelahan. It wasn't long before Adam and his friends joined Natalie's friendship circle, and for the almost five years from the day that they had met up until 2012, they had just been friends that had occasionally gone out drinking together. Natalie worked shifts at McDonald's and would oftentimes come straight back home from her shifts and then go straight back out again with her friends, uh, whether that meant just going for a drive or going to the pub. Adam had found work at a local bakery in a supermarket and had begun to train as a BT engineer, a telecommunications engineer for those who don't live in the UK. Adam had surrounded himself with a small group of men who encouraged him endlessly. We're actually going to be coming back to that group of men in a little bit. Adam had, over the years, engaged in several relationships, which could be described as no strings attached, though he had been in just a handful of official relationships, with the latest one coming to an end in 2012. This breakup prompted Adam to update his Facebook relationship status to single, and it wasn't long before Natalie saw this relationship status update and messaged him. Natalie, like Adam, had also just come out of a relationship. It was actually Natalie's first serious long-term relationship, and it had ended in heartbreak for her in June of 2012. 
As in an attempt to try and repair her broken heart, Natalie decided to put herself back out there and just have a bit of fun. So when she messaged Adam, they began talking and eventually started seeing each other in a no strings attached type of relationship. They would text one another, go to the cinema together and go on drives. And for Natalie's mother Adele, this new relationship, albeit a friends with benefits relationship, was welcomed. Natalie had been in a dark place and it appeared as if Adam was bringing a degree of happiness back into Natalie's life. So long as Natalie was happy, Adele was happy. As Adam worked in the bakery of a local supermarket, when Natalie and the mother Adele would go and do this food shop, it wasn't uncommon for Natalie in the summer of 2012 to tell her mum that she was just going to go over and talk to Adam while her mum continued doing the food shop. Adele would ask Natalie whether Adam was her boyfriend, but Natalie would always reply by saying that they weren't in a relationship. That the friendship between Adam and Natalie had been more serious than Adele had been led to believe. The pair had grown very close as friends, and on the 9th of July 2012, they had sex together for the first time in Adam's car. Even though Adam was presenting himself as this sweet and respectable man, underneath the facade was something far more sinister. He viewed Natalie as a piece of meat that he could use to satisfy his sexual desires, and he treated his courtship of Natalie as a trophy. Adam's friendship group was made up of three other men, Thomas Fuller, Matt Woods, and Steve Hughes. And the dynamic within this friendship group was deeply disturbing. The group saw Natalie as subhuman, nicknaming her JC, as they had joked she looked like James Corden. They would send offensive messages to one another in their group chats, degrading Natalie's appearance. According to some sources, Adam found it funny that he was, quote, sleeping with a larger woman. Every member of that group of friends that surrounded Adam were yes men. They hyped Adam up and joined in on the disturbing jokes. And when Natalie texted Adam three days after they had hooked up, claiming to have been pregnant, Adam's laughter quickly stopped. It is believed that Natalie's indication that she might be pregnant with Adam's child was a catalyst for the tragedy that looms on the horizon. Adam would later be described as not being ready to father a child with a woman he was not in a relationship with. This planted a seed of anger and hatred towards Natalie. Adam viewed this pregnancy as a failure and a massive hindrance to the successful life that he had planned out for himself. And this seed quickly grew into a dark fantasy. Adam decided that there was only one way to free himself of this failure in his life plan, and that was to get rid of Natalie. He believed that so long as Natalie was in the picture, his future would be unhappy and unsuccessful. And instead of doing the reasonable thing and talking with Natalie about whether the pregnancy was a good idea and exploring other options such as abortion or Adam giving up parental rights or even giving up the child for adoption, Adam decided that the only solution was murder. Natalie had only told a handful of friends about the potential pregnancy and had actually kept it a secret from her parents. Natalie's parents only learned of the pregnancy after tragedy had struck their family. In an attempt to externalize and voice the feelings that Adam was having, he took to social media and made a series of posts about what was on his mind. Now it's important to note that despite social media being such a public forum, it isn't uncommon for most people to use social media as a kind of diary, a way to express their emotions and externalize their thoughts. And that's exactly what Adam did. On the 23rd of July 2012, Natalie and Adam met up again to hang out. It's unclear if they engaged in sexual relations on that day, but what we do know is that after they had met up, Adam posted to Twitter, It's alright to kill someone these days, isn't it? Think I might do that. This wouldn't be the last time Adam would tweet about murder, with another tweet being published a week after the last that read, How do you do it? Hashtag murderous minds. It was at around this same time that Adam began to tell his group of friends about what happened about the pregnancy. And together, Adam Wheelerham, Tom Fuller, Matt Woods, and Steve Hughes began to joke about ways in which Adam could kill Natalie. The murder of Natalie seemed to become something of a running joke amongst the group of four men. On the 6th of September 2012, one of the four men in this group sent a message to Adam that disturbingly urged him to murder Natalie. And Adam responded by saying that he knew what he needed to do. It quickly became clear that this alleged joke had morphed into something far more sinister, a plan for Adam Wheelerham to commit murder. 
encouraged by Tom Fuller, Matt Woods, and Steve Hughes. They treated the concept of Natalie's murder almost like a dare, egging Adam on, encouraging him, giving him positive reinforcements that murdering Natalie was clearly the only way out of the situation he had found himself in. They had a complete disregard for the fact that they were discussing murdering a person. It was a game to them. On the 19th of September 2012, Adam Wheelahan sent a message to the group chat that had his friends in that read, I'm going to do JC tomorrow. JC being their nickname for Natalie and the context being murder. And Adam's friends, Tom Fuller, Matt Woods and Steve Hughes continued to encourage and feed into this violence. Natalie was, unfortunately, none the wiser of the fate that these four men had planned for her. She believed that her friends with benefits relationship to Adam was still going well and it was just a bit of fun for her. What she thought of her potential pregnancy is largely unknown, but what we do know is that Natalie was happy to continue meeting up with Adam. The weekend before Natalie would be brutally murdered, the weekend commencing the 28th of September 2012, Natalie and her family attended Atel Jarvis's best friend's 50th birthday party. At this party, the family of four had a fun time, enjoying being around friends, and as you can see from the images that I'm showing on screen, it just seemed like everyone was having a good time with one another. Although, as the celebrations continued into the evening, Natalie's mother Adele noted Natalie to be having some kind of an argument on the phone. It was immediately clear that Natalie was on the phone with Adam, and that whatever they were talking about was extremely heated. Natalie's family just put the argument down to the usual motions that those in a relationship go through. They thought Adam and Natalie were likely now in a proper relationship and it was just one of those bumps in the road. Unfortunately for Natalie's sister Gemma, that 50th birthday party weekend would be the last weekend she would see her younger sister alive. In the days leading up to that particular September weekend and throughout the weekend, Adam Wheelahan and his group of friends started messaging each other more and more intensely. Their focus, the murder of Natalie Jarvis. Notably, on the 30th of September 2012, Adam Wheelahan received a message from one of the men in his friendship group asking him whether he had, quote, killed anyone tonight. Adam replied simply, only in my mind. Sadly, Adam's imaginary murder would be something he would bring into reality in October of 2012. On the 1st of October 2012, Adam picked up Natalie from her house to go on a drive together. Hiding his true murderous intentions under the invitation of hanging out, Adam and Natalie and one of Natalie's friends drove to the local Burger King to grab some food and just hang out together. The presence of Natalie's friends put a proverbial spanner in the works for Adam's intention to kill, though after finishing up their meals at Burger King, Natalie's friends left to go home, leaving Adam alone with Natalie. The pair then drove around in Adam's car for several hours, listening to music and talking. At least, that's what was initially thought to have happened. When you take a deeper look, Natalie's social media suggested something much more sinister was taking place. Natalie posted a Facebook status that read, I've been kidnapped. Can someone come and rescue me? Natalie's older sister Gemma saw this Facebook status and phoned up Natalie to make sure she was all right. According to Gemma, Natalie just laughed off what she had written on Facebook, calling it simply a joke. It is believed that Natalie's Facebook post and Gemma's phone call to her scared Adam. And so Adam decided that it wasn't time to act on his and his friend's evil plan. Messages sent from Adam to his group chat give us an insight into what he was thinking. I wanted to do it, so I kept driving round, but then she said that, had my knife ready and everything. Adam then dropped Natalie back off at home and started to think of a plan that will let him murder Natalie and get away with it. On October 3rd, 2012, Natalie clocked off from her shift at McDonald's early, and so I phoned up her father Mark to come pick her up and bring her home. And so Mark did, and after getting home, Natalie jumped into the shower to wash off the smells that stick to you when you work at a place such as McDonald's. Natalie then jumped into fresh pyjamas, got out her phone and started messaging her friends. Also at Natalie's house was one of Natalie's closest friends, Chelsea, who was set to stay over at the Jarvis family home that night. It was as these best friends were getting themselves ready for bed that Natalie received a message from Adam Wheelahan. Adam invited Natalie to go on a drive with him so they could talk to her about what's next in the relationship. He also asked Natalie for sex. 
And so Natalie went to go tell her mother, Adele, that she was headed out for a little bit. She was still dressed in her pyjamas, dressing gown and slippers. Adele and Natalie had a quick cuddle and chat before Natalie got up to leave. She told her mother that, quote, I'm going out with Ad for a bit, mum. Ad being her nickname for Adam. As Natalie left, she said Schlaters, which is her cute slang for see you later. This was something that Natalie had always said before she had left to go out. Natalie then told her mother Adele that she loved her and then left. That was the last time that Adele would ever speak to her 23-year-old daughter ever again. And the clock began ticking, counting down the time as Natalie grew closer to the horrific and gruesome end that Adam and his friends had planned for her. Now, it's important to note that Adam hadn't gone over to Natalie's house to pick her up alone. There was actually a third person in the car, Thomas Fuller, one of the men in Adam's friendship group. And the presence of Thomas Fuller was kept secret from Natalie. She had no idea of the trap she was happily walking into. Adam had actually met up with Thomas earlier that evening at the pub. You can see the pair on this enhanced CCTV footage walking through the pub at about 10pm on the 3rd of October 2012. Adam and Thomas had also met up with their friend Matt Woods, and together they went from pub to pub. You can see them on this footage walking to another pub at about 10.20pm that evening. It was during this pub crawl that Adam, encouraged by his friends, decided that tonight was the night to carry out their plans. CCTV footage then shows Adam's red car, which Adam was driving with Thomas Fuller in the passenger seat, headed in the direction of Natalie's home at 24 minutes past 10 that evening. Adam had asked Thomas Fuller to come with him to, quote, confront Natalie, and Thomas happily obliged. Adam arrived to pick up Natalie at around 10.30pm. Natalie climbs into the passenger seat of Adam's car, with Adam sat in the driver's seat and Thomas Fuller hidden in the trunk of the car. Thomas had climbed into the trunk shortly before they had pulled up to Natalie's house, and the reasoning for why he did that is something heavily discussed in the trial that follows this tragedy. We're going to explore that later in this episode. It was crystal clear that Thomas was well aware of Adam's intentions to murder Natalie, and he did nothing to intervene. He didn't try and talk Adam out of it, rather encouraging him to go through with it. Adam drove Natalie, with Thomas hidden in the trunk, to the area of Burton Street in Swanley Village, close to the intersection of Swanley Village Road and Burton Street. It was once they had started down Burton Street that Natalie noticed that the warning lights for the trunk had come on, and so she told Adam to stop the car so that they could make sure that the trunk was closed. We can see on this CCTV footage Adam's car just seconds after they had pulled over to the side of the road. The time was 22.41pm. They had been driving with Thomas concealed in the trunk for 10 minutes, and unfortunately Natalie only had seconds left to live. Natalie and Adam both got out of the car, as we can see. Natalie began to move to the rear of the vehicle to check the trunk, while Adam grabs a multi-tool that he'd been issued as part of his training to become a BT engineer from the driver's side door pocket in his car. Brandishing this multi-tool, Adam launched a brutal, violent, and angry attack on Natalie. Adam stabs Natalie in the neck more than 20 times. Natalie also sustained numerous defensive wounds. She had tried to protect herself with her hands and arms. One of the wounds that Natalie had sustained to the neck measured 11 centimeters long, her internal jugular vein being cut in two. As Natalie was attacked, she attempted to flee and run to safety. This crime scene reconstruction shows digitally the forensic evidence found by investigators. Each yellow indicator represents a blood splatter found on the road. You can easily see the distance that Natalie travelled in her desperate attempts to run away from Adam. The distance between the yellow indicators closer to the location of Adam's car reveals that Natalie had tried to flee, likely running at a fast pace, which caused the drips to fall at a further distance from one another. Though, as we move through the crime scene, closer to where Natalie's body would later be found by passerbys, you can see the yellow indicators getting closer and closer together. This pattern is indicative of someone slowing down, the drips getting closer and closer together as her pace slowed. You can also see how Natalie moved from one side of the road to another. The severity of the wounds that Natalie had sustained at the hands of Adam had caused severe hemorrhaging. She was bleeding out. Eventually, Natalie collapsed to the grounds into this ditch, 
as she began to die from her injuries. The entire time she tried to escape, Adam chased after her, inflicting more wounds on her. In the process of this attack, Adam slipped and cut himself on the hand with the knife. This just shows the severe force that Adam was using to attack Natalie. As Natalie bled to death in the ditch on the side of the road, she begged Adam to phone her mum. She said, quote, I'm dying, please ring my mum. In her final moments, Natalie wanted the comfort of her mother. She wanted to be with someone she loved completely. But Adam denied her that. Adam took Natalie's phone and threw it into a nearby bush. We can see the location where the phone would later be found by investigators on the virtual mock-up of the crime scene. When Adam was certain that Natalie was dead, tormenting her in her final moments, he ran back to where he'd gotten out of his car. At some point during the attack, Thomas Fuller had gotten out of the trunk of Adam's car and into the driver's seat. We can see on this CCTV footage, taken at around 43 minutes past 10 p.m., Thomas Fuller turning Adam's car around and driving off. Adam had jumped into the car just seconds before this CCTV footage began. The two men then fled from the scene of the murder. The 999 emergency services call was made at 11.18 p.m. after passerbys had found Natalie barely conscious in the ditch. Natalie had been left by Adam Wheelahan and Thomas Fuller to die alone, in the cold, on the side of the road, for a period of almost 40 minutes. And as we discussed at the start of this episode, despite the best efforts of paramedics and the passerbys, Natalie Jarvis passed away and succumbed to her injuries. Meanwhile, Adam Wheelahan and Thomas Fuller drove to meet up with their other two friends, Matt Woods and Steve Hughes. The group of four men then went to a local shop, a Tesco's, to purchase alcohol and cigarettes. Inside the Tesco's, the group joked around about the murder that Adam had just committed. Adam had owed Matt Woods £30, and so gave Matt this money back inside the Tesco's. One of the notes that Adam had given Matt Woods had Natalie's blood on it, and so Matt threw the note back at him, laughing. The group treated the heinous and violent crime that had just been orchestrated by all four of them as a joke. It was just a bit of banter to them, and they wanted to celebrate. Though, after celebrating with alcohol and cigarettes for a few hours together, the reality of the situation began to sink in for a few of the men in the friendship group. Those men ultimately persuaded Adam Wheelahan to go to the police station and hand himself in which he did at around 2 a.m. on the 4th of October, 2012. Some sources detail that when Adam had handed himself in, he still had blood on his hands and face from the attack. As the morning birds began to chirp and the sun began to rise, Natalie's mother, Adele Jarvis, woke up at 6.20 a.m., completely unaware of the horrors that had unfolded the night before. Adele went to the bathroom and noted that Natalie's bedroom door was still open. Peering inside, Adele saw that only Natalie's best friend Chelsea was on the bed. Natalie was nowhere to be seen. In a panic, Adele asked Chelsea where Natalie was, and Chelsea replied by saying that she didn't know and that she'd been trying to phone and make contact with Natalie all night long. By this point, Natalie's father Mark had also gotten up out of bed to see what the commotion was all about, and Mark tried to find a reasonable explanation for Natalie being missing. Perhaps she had just gone over and stayed at her sister Gemma's house that night. Adele then rang up Gemma and asked her if Natalie was with her, but when Gemma said no, she wasn't with her, Adele explained that Natalie hadn't come home the night before. True panic then set in, and Adele phoned 999 to report her daughter as missing. She explained how it was so out of character for Natalie to have not come home without at least sending a text message or ringing them up. Adele knew that Natalie had gone out in her pyjamas and dressing gown and that she had no form of identification on her at all. The 999 operator then asked Adele how tall Natalie was and for the colour of her hair. Unbeknownst to the Jarvis family, the police had identified Natalie's body an hour before Adele's call to emergency services and had dispatched the police to go to the family home. The detectives drove over to the Jarvis family home and told them that Natalie had died and that she had been murdered. Adam Wheelahan was arrested when he handed himself in and was formally charged with murder. Adam had claimed self-defence, that Natalie had attacked him and that she had been harassing him. Thomas Fuller was also arrested in connection to the murder of Natalie Jarvis. The trial against Adam Wheelahan and Thomas Fuller was set to start on the 3rd of April 2013. 
It's important to note that neither of the two other men, Steve Hughes or Matt Woods, were prosecuted at all in connection to the murder. Adele told me when I spoke with her that Steve Hughes and Matt Woods were deemed reluctant witnesses. Steve Hughes had claims that he had stayed home that evening babysitting his daughter with his mother and that he hadn't been involved at all. Though text message evidence contradicts this, he had been actively texting and messaging the other men in the group all evening. He had been fully aware that Natalie had been left for dead and had gone out to meet up with Adam, Matt and Thomas to celebrate what had happened. Adam Wheelahan and Thomas Fuller pled not guilty to the murder charges brought against them. Adam's defence team pushed the narrative that he had killed Natalie in self-defence, and Thomas's defence team claims that whatever Adam did to Natalie, he had not been a part of it. Thomas took the stand during the trial, and what he told the court was interesting to say the least. According to reports in Kent Online, Thomas explains how he had climbed out of the trunk of Adam's car to see Adam and Natalie standing with their hands on each other's shoulders. He then claims that Adam and Natalie walked further on down the street and that he thought he heard Natalie ordering Adam to get off. When Thomas was asked if he was aware of what was happening, Thomas replied by saying, quote, I couldn't see no weapons and there was no talk of a knife previously. I didn't know at first, but as they went round the corner, I turned the car around and thought the worst. When asked to clarify, Thomas said that he believed Adam was killing Natalie. When Thomas was asked why exactly he was in the trunk of Adam's car, he told the court that he had been hiding in the boots in the trunk because he wanted to hear whether Natalie had been slagging him off and slagging off his deceased father. Thomas had alleged that Adam had told him that Natalie had been making fun of his father passing away from cancer. This was a complete fabrication. Sadly for the Jarvis family, Natalie had lost her own grandfather to cancer, and she took this loss very deeply. It was never a subject she would have ever dreamed to have joked about. After turning Adam's car around, Thomas told the courts that he had actually intended to have driven the car down the road towards Adam and Natalie, but decided not to as he didn't want to get involved. A few moments later, Thomas claims Adam jogged up to the car and got into the passenger seat. Thomas told the courts that Adam had blood on his face and tracksuit bottoms. These are photographs taken by the police of blood stains and markings found within Adam's vehicle. This is a police photograph of Adam's tracksuit bottoms from the night of the murder. Text messages were shown to the court, which actually showed that Thomas Fuller had been fully well aware of the murder that was taking place. Thomas had sent a text message while still in the trunk of Adam's car to one of his friends saying that, quote, He's done it. He's fucking done it. When Thomas and Adam met up with Matt Woods and Steve Hughes, and Adam explained what had happened and what he had done, they all stayed calm and didn't really react at all. It was all just a big joke to them. Adam Wheelahan's defence in court was a spectacle to say the least. According to Adam's accounts, Natalie had actually been blackmailing and threatening Adam with the information that she was pregnant with Adam's child. And Adam claims that it had been Natalie that had messaged him asking him to meet that night and not the other way around. Adam told the courts that he was scared to meet up with Natalie. He thought that she might hurt him. And so he arranged for Thomas Fuller to hide in the trunk of his car for backup and so that Thomas could hear what Natalie had allegedly been saying about his deceased father. Adam claims that his intentions that night were to talk to Natalie and to break all contacts with her. According to his testimony, Natalie had been the one to retrieve the multi-tool from this fabric holder, which I'm showing on screen, in the driver's side door pocket, which meant that she had to reach over to the driver's side door pocket and grab this multi-tool, but let's continue. And that Natalie had told Adam to pull over because she thought somebody was in the trunk of his car. Adam claims Natalie had told him, quote, if there is someone in the car, I'm going to kill you. When the pair got out of the car and went to open the trunk, Natalie allegedly lunged at Adam with the multi-tool. After a short struggle, Adam managed to grab the multi-tool from Natalie and used it to defend himself. Allegedly, according to his own testimony, which is quite frankly bullshit, if you're defending yourself from an attack and you have managed to get the weapon from your attacker, you do not then begin an assault down the road of continuous stabbings. Adam told the courts that he had been fighting for his life. Of course, an overwhelming amount of evidence against Adam Wheelahan completely destroyed his version of events. 
from the message records to the superficial cut Adam had sustained and the forensic reconstruction of the crime scene. Interestingly, no drugs or alcohol were found in Natalie's body. And further, she had not been pregnant at the time of her death. She also had no indications of a recent termination of a child. The manner in which Natalie has sustained these injuries, over 20 stab wounds concentrated in one area, completely contradicts Adam's version of events. One does not simply sit there and take over 20 stabbings to the neck and accept it like it was nothing. It goes against every basic human instinct for survival. I mean, no, that Natalie hadn't stood still. We know that she had tried to flee and escape, but Adam kept going. Even after he was allegedly out of danger, he kept chasing Natalie down. He hunted to kill. The jury deliberated Adam Wheelahan's sentence for just under five hours. And when they returned to court, they found Adam Wheelahan guilty of the murder of Natalie Jarvis. The presiding judge told the court, quote, I am satisfied there was an intention to kill rather than cause serious bodily harm. And there was clear premeditation. Interestingly, Thomas Fuller was acquitted of all charges. Adam Wheelahan was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. He will be eligible for parole on the 19th of April, 2039. Thomas Fuller, Matt Woods, and Steve Hughes, despite their involvement in planning, encouraging, and celebrating Natalie's murder, walk free to this day. Those three men were fully complicit in the murder of Natalie Jarvis, a view that Adele shared with me when I spoke with her. The Jarvis family live every day since Natalie's murder, with the gravity of her senseless murder on their minds. True justice for Natalie has not been served, so long as Thomas Fuller, Matt Woods, and Steve Hughes continue to walk free without any form of punishment. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and you hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video just like this one. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode and providing the support to make courage like this possible. And a special thank you to Adele Jarvis and her family for talking with me about this case. If you have a case that you would like me to cover on this channel, then you can send in your submission over on requestacase.com. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. Mm.